Hey everyone, before we get to it, I want to quickly give a round of applause to our newest Patreon supporters, Michael Beatty and Justin Latham. I hope I pronounced your names correctly. Thank you both so much for joining the Patreon, both joining the Council of Elders. So, so excited to have you here. Michael, thank you so much for your message. We truly, truly appreciate it. And we're going to have to figure out a punchline episode for you. And everyone should go check out the episode I did with Justin on his podcast, This Just In. We talked about Motion City soundtracks, even if it kills me for like two hours. It was so, so, so much fun. I'll put a link in the show notes. Again, thank you all so much and now let's get into the episode (laughs) Tom I just came to my senses that (laughs) it's been way too long for us to have not done a Lesson Jake episode senseless man I I can't we can't even wait long enough to start the show what is going on everybody I'm Tom and I'm Pat We're best friends, and you're listening to the Reminiscent Podcast. Doesn't work as well on audio, I gotta say. (laughs) (laughs) We are talking about science is selling yourself short this week, and they open the video in a way that is my favorite video (laughs) opening possibly ever. We'll talk about it later, though. Sorry to cut you off, Tom. It is criminal how irregularly we discuss less than Jake after listening to this song and revisiting all of Anthem. It like low key might be one of my top 15 albums of all time. I love this band. I love this album. Why are we not doing, do you want to just like do the next like two months (laughs) less than Jake to make, to make up for all the time we haven't talked about them. Yeah. Not to mention the fueled by ramen stuff, not to mention the road dog stuff where they toured with everybody we've ever loved. (laughs) <laughs> Again, we talked, we hinted a couple weeks ago that we were going to head this direction that Less Than Jake is the reason Gen Y individuals were ever entertained in the first place. <laughs> so, <laughs> like they're responsible for all of it somehow. So yeah, we're going to get into it. We're going to introduce a new segment to honor their like willingness to tour called, oh. and we always mention some tours off the like Wikipedia page we just happened to see, but I'm going to have you, you know how when you drive past a cemetery, Tom, and you have to hold your breath? <laughs> I'm going to zip that. through an abridged <laughs> version of the tours they went on after releasing Anthem and see if you can hold your breath while oh. I read all of them. Because <laughs> they go everywhere. Let me find my inhaler. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> but we're getting so far ahead of ourselves. Yes, less than Jake. Yeah. Fueled by Ramen is a side thought of this particular discussion. I think we wanted to talk about science of selling yourself short because, well, why did we pick it? Is it I mean, I think... You and I each have our favorite tunes. This might be really up there, but when you look at Anthem overall, like you said, it's like, oh my God. We we joked about this with a Mayday record the other day. It's like, oh, I didn't think I knew that one. It's like, oh, I know every word of that one. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, (laughs) oh, I'm extremely (laughs) familiar. Um, You're like, oh, this is, like you said, but what's interesting when it happens in cases like this, you're like, oh, not only did I forget I love this record, I forgot this might be a Dark Horse Desert Island. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, top five albums of all time type of like, I know, and and we say that a lot on the show, but like really formative years, the the high school, junior high we went to was freakishly pro-ska. I mean, we should, I don't think we've ever like taken a, a breath to really expand upon that. Yeah, man. I mean, Iroquois, the school that I met you at when I transferred in eighth grade is responsible for so, like everything. I mean, really it was my gateway to pretty much everything and less than jake and ska was some of the first shit that people were like really shoving down my throat and it's really like the only time i have interacted with ska on like a day-to-day basis entirely because of that school i don't know what it was but those kids love to skate yeah i think it was like (laughs) we had a freakishly high percentage of the students at that school like it was a single a in Pennsylvania sports school, which is the smallest out of like quad A, uh, okay. you know, being the top. But I think we performed at a, like a triple A school size level or marching band. I think one in every five students or some crazy, st- I forget the exact stats, but Mr. Chase, the music teacher was talking about it one day. Like we were back when the marching band, maybe it still is, but it, while we were there, it was really humming from seven through 12th. Everyone just whether, you know, the pit was huge. The color guard was huge. Um, but there was a lot of people who, well, due to the size of the school itself, you'd have this, these talented horn players 
that also had to be the football and soccer and basketball and baseball players as well. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, so it's just right. kind of like the sound of the horn was kind of like in the fabric of who attended the school just in general based on how few people there were and how many horns were in the band. You know what I mean? So like right, right. talent shows, people would whip out Gainesville Rock City or All My Best Friends Are Metalheads and it would just be like, this makes sense because if you're going to have a certain number of you know, Lawrence Park individuals on a stage, chances are one of them is going to be playing a horn of some sort. I know oh, down the street from me, Dave Hall, like notoriously was into the trombone his whole life. And I think he yes. just played it because he could joke about tromboners and stuff, which I think like <laughs> really far back, that was the root of it all. But um, it was just quirky and weird and random and unique. And um, and you played trumpet. I did. I did. Yeah. For a long time. I don't time. think we've ever talked about this and you were like pretty good. <laughs> no. I remember the first band practice we ever had. You brought the trumpet just in case we, we could have easily been a ska band. <laughs> oh, it was dude. Parallel universes, 35% of them. We were a ska band for sure. <laughs> right. Like that's a, like one out of it. Yeah. So no. Yeah. I have my little, uh, middle school, <laughs> Iroquois middle school MVP of all the obnoxious trophies my mom saved. Um, <laughs> That was the middle school band MV, most valuable player. With the, it was a little musical note on a little stand, but um, hell yeah, yeah, no, guys. I remember Corey and Zach, and I think your stepbrother Corey. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was like, yeah, it was oh, so he played odd. Oh, That's right. Yeah, I mean, it was not uncommon for much of the soccer team in the fall to have just grueling during the two weeks of like band camp. Yeah, to be also doing the soccer two a days, sort of like to be up from like. <laughs> from 6 a.m. to like 8 p.m., just running and walking and playing in like the best lung capacities in the Tri-County area or whatever, you know what I mean? Just like... <laughs> but yeah, like Streetlight Manifesto and all yeah. those, like, big they were just the around. Stable. And like the Postal Service was a big deal, Yes, but the horn cover of Such Great Heights was a bigger deal or something. You know what I mean? It almost <laughs> felt that way um, when it dropped. So it was just kind of around in a way that, I'd be surprised if it was equally around at all the high schools. I know we all live the same version of the same life. And I think there was like a certain wave of techno happening at the time. And we weren't special in that regard because certain circles were also listening to a ton of techno. I know everyone had to experience Sandstorm in real time, but the techno and Scott thing in Iroquois felt a little more, uh, felt a little bigger than like at what you were getting the vibe from other schools at. I don't know if I'm way off on that or not. No, I mean, it is really interesting. So I played in the marching band in ninth grade only. I played snare and you always hear, I mean, there was like a whole movie about like, you know, band nerds and it's just like a trope that the kids who are in band have the headgear and they're just the nerdiest people ever. But what I experienced at Iroquois that I didn't experience being in band competitions and seeing all the other schools is that. I don't know, like Iroquois was very, um, I don't know if diplomatic is the right word, but it was like the cool kids were also in the marching band. So like it kind of gave permission for like marching band people to like not be made fun of. Like I just felt like it was very nice. Like, I don't know. It was such an interesting group of people in marching band, people I would never expect to be there. So if the cool kids who like listen to good music are in marching band, they're the ones playing the trumpet. Of course, they're going to try to have fun with it and like incorporate it into like whatever music they normally listen to. So I, I don't know, man. I think that's a pretty good theory. I think it makes sense. It, it was an interesting group of people in marching band. You know, I don't know, like, um, oh, this is a side note. Last year we were tweeting about doing a summer of ska and we almost did. We were like <laughs> lining up the episodes a little bit, but we were a little like, you know, imposter syndrome is a dangerous, dangerous. Like, oh, concept. for, sure. for um, sure. That probably doesn't exist, but I don't want to go there today. Anyway, if everybody has it, it doesn't, I guess is kind of the root of what I was trying to say. Anyway, but what I was trying to say is, and this is, doesn't matter for the whole episode, but you know that um, Prince of Egypt animated movie? I never saw it. Anyway, but I know there's these it. like shaman, <laughs> these two shaman characters that are with the uh, the pharaoh, and they're always like, basically the movie paints you know paints them to be like these like uh, con artist types, and uh, they're always like by the power of Ra, and uh, <laughs> I always sung in my head, it's the summer of ska, you know, like to the tune of how they said by the power of Ra in the movie. Doesn't matter. I had to get that out there, and uh, we can move right along with that. No need to uh, spend too much time there. But anthem came out in 03, pretty much the wheelhouse for the show, right? I mean, like, there's so many albums, so many songs, but surprisingly dense collection of hits, and oh my God, it was, yeah. I think we'll get into the fast facts in a minute here, but, like, commercially pretty successful based on what they had done to this point. Yeah, and I mean, Anthem was the peak of their commercial success, so they were, like, firing on all cylinders. They were really finding the nice balance between 
whatever ska was in its underground scene in like the more popular just kind of like rock of the time and they somehow transcended into i don't know like more of the mainstream with this album yeah it's kind of interesting like we're not really a mount rushmore show or anything but like i don't know where does lesson jake rank in your mind or like in real time like um I don't know. I've been try- I was trying to put that thought together before we hit record. Obviously, I was unable to reach whatever conclusion I was trying to reach before we did. <laughs> um, I mean, not high enough when you rank them against just like alt rock or whatever. Obviously, um, I don't really know how they would even rank overall as like biggest ska band. Like, I think they would, but I haven't like lived in the ska verse or anything. Like, Real Big Fish also comes to mind, but I don't know if like more people would know. The impression that I get by Mighty Mighty Boston's and assume that like they were bigger overall. I don't know, man. I always thought Les and Jake were like the Giants, but I honestly have no idea. I just when I think of ska, I think of them, but that's because I'm just a dumb boy who doesn't know ska very well. <laughs> well, I know Adrian's gonna tweet at us about the Aquabats regardless of how this Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pool party, baby. <laughs> ran out, ran out, ran out. Anyway, let's get into the fast facts before this episode gets away from us too far. How about that? <laughs> After you. Okay. Well, actually, real quick, Zach almost got a tattoo based on the song we're talking about today. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so he really wanted this tattoo of, like, a guitar, and the melody of Roger singing I'm My Own Worst Enemy swirling around the guitar so that it would be, like, you would see the back of some of the notes as it, like, went behind the guitar, and the tattoo artist was like... I don't know, man. I think that's overly complicated. And then he just like gave up on the idea entirely. And I just feel like it's so funny. Like when you're 16, either your convictions are like based on nothing and so fucking strong or they're like so fragile and fleeting. It's just like one hour. It's like, I don't know about that idea. He's like, all right, fine. F- the entire tattoo. <laughs> but I do remember him making a sketch and bringing it over at band practice. Like, yo, I'm getting a tattoo for this song. I love it so much. And I wish we got matching bro tats. It's a killer song. You and Zach are pretty pretty high on matching bro tats. <laughs> right. And I don't think Zach and I even have one, which is I don't know. We the three of us are gonna get four hundred par tattoos at some point, but You've you've maintained this theory for a while. We're gonna do it. Yeah, well, you know what else I forgot? I was looking over the notes. I'm like, we just started talking, I got too excited about Iroquois horn theories that <laughs> um yeah, I, I forgot I used to tell people we shared the stage with less than Jake back oh my. when we, the band was really young. <laughs> Because we played this Battle of the Bands at Penn State, and Less Than Jake happened to be playing a Baron show or played at that event the year prior. So I'm like, <laughs> right, so. yeah, I think it's not a stretch at all to say that we have reached the caliber of show that we could have been sharing this age with Less Than Jake, you know, because we were at that same event just a year later. And we were like the first band to play <laughs> at like three in the afternoon. <laughs> In 2005, our freshman year of high school, yes, we told the story not that long ago. We opened a battle of the bands that Punchline and I Am the Avalanche headlined, and they played maybe 10 hours after we did. Like, I think we played at like 1130 to like the venue setting up, essentially. Yeah, we felt so cool skipping school, but there were oh so many God. college students that were just starting their day. Like yes. the judges that had to be there that early kind of snapped their fingers to our cover of All the Small Things by Blink-182. <laughs> but um, you know, this was like early, early in our band's uh, existence. But yeah. yeah, in my mind, I was like, hey, we we essentially opened for less than Jake in my mind. Like. That's that's the level of show we've got to. It felt that way, though. We were you I know, know. sophomores, I think. I mean, I Am the Avalanche and Punchline is no small peanuts. I think um, no, Lesson G yeah. even toured with Punchline. You know, it's interesting. The, when we do the the tours segment that may only exist for this episode, I think you'll enjoy some of the names that pop up. But, but let me say, let me say, facts. though. No, sure, let, yeah, well, no. Hey, me talk <laughs> over you on this show. Get out. <laughs> but let me say. So the next year, we sent in the same demo that we had that we recorded when we were like 13. Or no, wait, we we got studio time because we got like a discount coupon from that from, show. The, from the first year that we played. So yeah, we sent yeah. in like the same recordings and they didn't accept us to the Battle of the Bands. Really good move on their part. We only got in the first year because one band dropped out like three days before the show. <laughs> but anyway, so we weren't selected and i had a hand surgery on like april 18th and i get a phone call as i'm waking up from surgery it's d the event organizer asking if we want to play on (laughs) no joke pat it was on 420 
and less than Jake was headlining the show. And of course, I played drums and my hands all f***ed up. Like this was the battle of the bands the year after. The year after, less than Jake was headlining yeah. on 420, and we we had to say no because like I couldn't play drums, and that was so devastating but i gotta tell you man of course i didn't partake i've been straight edge my whole life but seeing less than jake on 420 i have never had so much fun in a crowd in my entire life those motherfuckers skanked the entire show without you stop know, even when science of selling yourself short came on they just skanked slower i couldn't believe it <laughs> it was great travi mccoy was on the uh, lead singer syndrome podcast with the dude from silverstein and he was saying like being kind of a group that broke genre a little bit coming up in this in a in a, a scene that maybe supported maybe more pop punk this and that he was saying like less than jake was so nice to take us out but like less than jake motherfuckers and this is me paraphrasing travi probably poorly but he was like less than jake motherfuckers only f with less than jake like <laughs> that was us taking it on the chin every night like <laughs> it's like Lil wayne touring a blink 182 <laughs> like, you know what? there we, we there may be a just Maybe, but I think the lesson here is that like the loyalty of the fans, I was watching that video of them. And uh, again, I'm just going to say it was Belgium because I can't quite remember, but someone that follows them around the world had come from Japan just to see them in the, on this Wednesday in um, Belgium or whatever it was. So they have, I mean, people give the love back for all the, all the uh, miles they cover, but okay. Yeah. Less than Jake, American ska punk band from Gainesville, Florida formed in 1992, probably the earliest Woo. forming date we've set on the show probably i think blink and green day might like come close but yeah they're they're one of the elders for sure no, yeah maybe you're right okay so yeah today we're talking about uh, a song off their fifth studio album anthem came out no three groups most commercially successful to date featuring the singles first single she's gonna break soon which would have been a, another good video to do and we might yeah. just do it next week. Who, can, who knows? We're just eat, eat, pray loving this year. Featuring Alexis Bledel from none other than Gilmore Girls. Your favorite TV program. Again, <laughs> Less Than Jake basically wrote Gilmore Girls. They're the reason we've enjoyed anything. A punk Rory. I didn't know I needed that. So <laughs> Sure. Um, okay. And this is just an aside, but you know, with the Fueled by Ramen oh like, my God. Yeah. subplot to kind of all of this, started in 96 and the drummer Vinny was associated with the guy that started it. And they were working with Jimmy Eat World as early as 98. In my head, wow. in the context of this show, Vinny himself started it in 03, plucked Fall Out Boy out of obscurity and then just ran away with Panic at the Disco or whatever. But like, obviously <laughs> it, it dates way, way further. Yeah, started yeah. in Gainesville, all that stuff. So I had to just say that as we've been speculating wildly for like years about the Fueled By stuff without ever really even looking at their website. Okay, uh, toured all over the world, specifically before recording Anthem, and they were supporting Bon Jovi. <laughs> what? <laughs> and MXPX for a little while, going to places like Japan and throughout Europe with MXPX and things like that. So like just, I saw Bon Jovi on the Wikipedia page and you know, I enjoy like the weirder parts of the Wikipedia pages. We, you know, scrub doing the show. That's, yeah. that's one of my favorites. Like, sure. I'm, you know, like, <laughs> I'm sure the gym class heroes didn't feel like the most supported opening for less than Jake. But I'm sure Less Than Jake didn't feel, <laughs> uh, maybe they could speak to that. Come on the show, Less Than Jake, we'd love to have you. But I'm oh sure they God. were a li maybe out of place, opening up, <laughs> you know, like stadium anthem rock, rocker. How did that happen? Famous Who? New Jersey and Bon Jovi, John Bon Jovi. <laughs> Who dropped off the tour the day before the first date? <laughs> I don't know. That's so amazing, though. Um Okay, September 02, they meet with Rob Cavallo, who produced a few Green Day albums they liked, as the story goes. Are you ready for another round of your favorite segment, the Wikipedia Sounds Like Game? The Wikipedia <laughs> sure. Sounds Like Game. Is everybody ready to play the Wikipedia Sounds Like Game? Quote, this is straight from the page, this is my favorite part of anything we've ever done on the show, because these are always all over the place. Quote, musically, the sound of Anthem has been described as pop punk, pop rock, and ska punk, drawing comparisons to the work of Good Charlotte. <laughs> what? End quote. What <laughs> the f***? <laughs> that's so crazy that that sentence even yeah. exists. That's someone who has never in their life listened to pop punk, just like <laughs> throwing <laughs> shit at the wall. <laughs> yeah, the, we. I usually like overzealous music writers trying to describe something as my favorite thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. insanely anonymous 
Wikipedia like gatekeepers writing the most crazy sounds like <laughs> comparisons on Wikipedia pages is much more satisfying, I think. Um, okay. Oh my God. Science is more of a mid-tempo ska and reggae song. You mentioned like, <laughs> I didn't know you had seen them. <laughs> Skanking just slower. <laughs> the song. <laughs> I guess I'm just now kind of getting the visual in my mind. Yeah, dude. I Ska shows are always the most fun ever. My old boss at Starbucks used, or he still is, he plays drums in the pie tasters. So we used to go to pie taster shows all the time when I was like 19 and 20 in DC. And um, I don't know, do people at a ska show know how to have fun? And yeah, they're just there to support everyone. It's, it's just the best. More ska in my life, for sure. Yeah, summer of ska. It's the summer of ska. <laughs> Coming up. Okay. I'm going to keep referencing this episode only a couple more times because I don't want to make it seem like we just are, are like paraphrasing that episode. But the Krista <laughs> makes a podcast episode. He had Roger on and he was talking about how like it is slower. He was like quoted a bunch of times saying it's like, it's just kind of its own thing. Science, science, science is kind of its own thing. Um, he said he, when he first wrote it, it was about a girl and they were doing a long distance relationship or something like that. But it was like 700 miles. Like that was kind of the oh. hook in his head starting off. So like the lyrics were different, I guess, after that. But it was something he had been kind of cooking up on his own um, and kind of like, Brought it to the table for Anthem, I guess. So this is something I actually had no idea about, but apparently Vinny Fiorello, who is the founder of Fuel by Ramen, wrote all of the lyrics for Less Than Jake, which I think is so cool. Like, the I don't know, you never think of the drummer being the lyricist. I guess you just assume that the lead singer writes everything, but... Demakes described him as, quote, the Phil Collins of our band, uh, which is... Great High drummer, praise. great lyricist. Depending on how you good feel melodies. about Phil Collins, that's how it right. is. <laughs> so I found a couple, I found this interview, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes that I thought was really interesting. It was an interview with Fiorello, uh, with Vinny, about the process for writing music. And he was just saying, like, he gets some ideas, he writes it down, and they roundtable it with the band. And then the band gets together and they kind of, like, edit what they wrote to come up with an idea altogether. But Vinny is still the one writing a lot of the lyrics and he had this really <laughs> he had this really interesting response where the interviewer said and then the guys in the band edit what you wrote and uh, his quote is yeah that's called being in a band plus i'm a wordy motherfucker <laughs> but the cool thing is it starts with an idea and how i feel and then it becomes a group thing that's less than jake and then when the song is done it morphs into a fan thing so it goes from this singular idea on a one-sided place into a group effort into a larger group headspace it's cool and i i don't know man i've never really heard someone like talk about it like that the way that the song morphs from like your idea the band gets together and makes it a band thing and then the crowd makes it their thing and it seems like he really appreciates and loves that process. And I just thought that was a really cool paragraph to to read in this interview. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, Chad Gilbert was on the Chris Demix podcast and was talking about their bassist not ever taking credit for songwriting, but <laughs> he was very had very glowing reviews and Demix was amused by this and agreed wholeheartedly that like there's always a member of the band who wouldn't take credit for lyrics or riffs or anything, but always is able to help a bridge come to life or right, do this right. or that. Or, you know, there's that little making it a band phenomenon that um takes takes the group right i guess depending on yeah the group, right it's not always, obviously that's not always the case <laughs> i guess i emo twitter would have inserted a ryan ross panic of the disco joke there of some sort but i don't have to do that <laughs> especially on an episode where uh fueled by ram is getting mentioned so often um <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I guess when they first played this at some K-Rock festival, it didn't go very well at all, and they could feel themselves really butchering it. And apparently, oh, um, no. <laughs> yeah, Roger was on the Chris Mix podcast and was talking about Lit was in the crowd that day, <laughs> ready to play that day. And they just were watching the crowd watch them really butcher this song that had such a similar, like, yeah, chorus to theirs, yeah. my own worst enemy. And they just said it was not, like, the most thrilling, like, not that the song would have died that day from one bad performance, but you can yeah. just feel the... Uh, feel the uh i guess anxiety come through the headphones on that one that's so funny <laughs> but yeah so what's interesting is during the recording sessions for anthem the band worked on a second self-produced album of additional tracks each night which became b is for b-sides which is kind of interesting to be Whoa. doing that much work at the same time dude that's because studio sessions are grueling and mind-numbing i don't know how they had the creativity to just be making other shit at the same time that is crazy I yeah love that. making a, a record that reached 45 on the I, 200 <laughs> I, which is like not nice. like <laughs> we rarely get to say top 50 albums on the show yeah, we think yeah. they're all top five top what's the <laughs> 
<laughs> What's the Sugar Ray lead singer thing? Like, no longer on the charts, but still number one in your hearts. Like, that's how we feel about all the albums we talk about on the show. But like, every once in a while, we're like, oh my God, that made top, you know, whatever, whatever. But like, yeah, we're just yeah. casually working on two albums. One of them might go top 50 on the Billboard, but you know, so whatever. Um, <laughs> Very interesting. But yeah, I mean, like stamina is not really the concern <laughs> with Less Than Jake as we're, you know, like about to do the tour, right. tours they did after this. This album, we should note, is the first of the bands to feature the saxophone player, Peter J.R. Wazaleski. Oh yeah. That's an eerie name. <laughs> yeah. It's, I was going to say, there were a lot of Polish individuals in Erie, Pennsylvania, so I'm assuming- I And I'm one right, of them. I don't know. As a Kelaszewski. <laughs> That's right. In 08, the band founded its own label, Sleep It Off Records. I just wanted to throw that in there just because like this band is always so busy <laughs> and I Why? just felt like it was relevant. Wait, hold on. Why weren't they just on Fueled By? Right? Good question. I think that's a different episode. I don't know. <laughs> I, I looked at the Fueled By Wikipedia page a little and I think some guy... It was founded in Gainesville with some guy who said it didn't come to life until he hooked up, met with Vinny. And then, you know, Fueled By came to life in the mid-90s, um, 96, ah. 98-ish, something like that. Um, but I don't know their band's relationship. Other than the fact that a, all these tours we're about to mention, there are definitely Fueled By acts on it. I just don't uh, really know okay, cool, cool. if they are that. It's a good question, Tom, but mm. yeah, I don't know how to answer the question. But let's do the tour segment, and then maybe we'll have a better feel for how to guess. I got one last thing here because I thought oh, yeah, it was get interesting. It out, you're going to have to hold your breath for like 11 minutes. On the show. This is the first, <laughs> Tom might die today. We're laying on the line for our art. All right. So I was, I never looked into like where the name less than Jake came from. Do you know the, the origin story? No, I'd love, I'd love to uh, be informed. All right. So Vinny uh, had a dog named Jake and it says he was usually treated better than the rest of the household. So everything in their house was less than Jake. <laughs> That's so nice. cool to like immortalize that your is, dog in your band name. It's like upsettingly cool. You're like, damn, this chick <laughs> is nice and fun and I want to be their friend. That's like on the level of uh, Jimmy Eat World as far as I know, like, I know. <laughs> just comes out of like the most um, heartfelt, nice place. Like, oh, I bet that was a good pup too. <laughs> All right. I'm ready to David Blaine my We say here, some just... <laughs> tours, but today we're talking about less than Jake tours. So get ready for the, you can... Skip the skip button as many times as you want. You're not going to outrun this segment. I'll still be talking about it no matter where you land. So buckle up, everybody. Tom, you don't have to hold your breath, but please try. I'm going to start talking in three, two, one. In March and April of 2003, Less Than Jake toured across the U.S. with Teen Idol's Punchline and Big Wig. Later in April, the group supported Good Charlotte and New Found Glory in the Honda Civic Tour. Following this, the band embarked on a headlining tour of Europe. The band toured across the U.K. throughout May of 2003. From June to August 2003, Less Than Jake went on Warp Tour. For the rest of August, the band went on a short tour of Europe, which included appearances at the Reading and Leeds festivals. They played a few U.S. shows in the early September before touring in New Zealand, Australia, and Japan, which lasted into October. In November and December, the band went on a U.S. tour to Fall Out Boy, and the first half also featured the band Yellow Card. In April and May, 2004, the band went on a short of North America, short, uh, sorry, tour of North America with the early November and Fall Out Boy and the Academy Is, which included an appearance of the skate and, at the Skate and Surf Festival. Following this, the band toured Europe in May of 2004 with Yellow Card and the AKAs. They played a few shows with the Academy Is before the touring the U.S. as a part of a project revolution between July and September 2004, and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I did it! <laughs> They didn't stop. They oh didn't stop. Oh, my God. Yo, that is gnarly. So, first of all, Project Revolution with Linkin Park. So, uh, Rob Cavallo, what I if, think that's like, how you pronounce the, it. Did you expect the AKAs and Punchline, which is a local thing I want to talk about in a minute, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Bon Jovi and the Project Revolution <laughs> tour to be part of this episode? <laughs> That's another kind of delightful thing. It's like, where, who, what stages were they on throughout this like phase of their career? So the answer to this on this, like for this week, is... Every stage possible, wherever there was <laughs> elevated ground, Less Than Jake was there with whoever else was doing something. Including us. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was a pleasure to share the stage with them, I guess. So. <laughs> no, I'm wondering, so I think it's pronounced Rob Cavallo. That sounds right to me. So he is like this legendary producer that has worked with Green Day and Lincoln Park, My Chemical Romance, Eric Clapton, Goo Goo Dolls, Dave Matthews Band, Kid Rock, Jawbreaker, Alanis Morissette, Black Sabbath, Phil Collins, Paramore, Sixpence, None of the Rich, Your Little Peep, Shine Down, Meatloaf. So I wonder if just being around him got the band some of these like insane gigs. I don't know. Pretty, pretty legendary well, they said uh, this producer. Was, I forget who they were signed with at the moment, but, you know, in the interviews you listen to, they talk about how this was their like 
you know, they put some money behind the music videos for this album. They were oh yeah in California, living the kind of like a good life, and they were like it seemed like they were happy to work on two records at once for the B side thing as well. They were just like <laughs> it was kind of the best um, big money, you know, uh, record label effort kind of of their careers. As it seems yeah, like yeah. how they felt. Um, but anyway, and yeah, I, I wouldn't shock me if they got you know hell, you know just said yes and were very agreeable to any tour that got suggested <laughs> in the boardroom that day because they were like oh you just yeah. want to do like can we circle all of the things on this paper yes is <laughs> all the answer. energy in answer. the world <laughs> right that's amazing that's amazing all right everyone i hope we're having a lot of fun but please give me just one single moment to thank our top tier patreon supporters our council of elders in this group we have johnny leftwich jason carey chris lukey nathan eshelman drew edwards carrie sanchez melanie devin booze reed gober cora lusty michael biatti and justin latham thank you all so much for supporting the show thank you to the many of you who contribute to the show on patreon it truly truly does mean the world to us and we are using this time to try to figure out the coolest, most fun things that we can do in the Patreon. And of course, we are open to any and all suggestions. If you'd like to check out the Patreon for yourself, you can head to patreon.com slash reminiscent. We offer three tiers, the Emo Kid, the Emo Veteran, and the Emo Elder. You can see if any of those work for you. If there's something in there you'd like to see, again, let us know. We'd be happy to add it. We're really down to try anything. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. Thank you to everyone listening. You are the reason we do this. We love you all so, so, so much. Let's get back to the episode. So the music video, Again, we could have done She's Gonna Break Soon pretty easily off of this record as well. And we will. Great video. And we, yeah, sure. But this one is um, a little tough to describe in an audio format, so I don't know how I'm going to tackle this, Tom, but it's it's heavily animated and features Roger, and there's shots of the band as well. But can we just talk about how it opens first and then talk about the animation maybe? Yeah, let's do. It's my favorite opening to a music video possibly ever, mostly because it features the beginning of this song, which I also love. Really. <laughs> but we see Roger in this like cartoon world, and he's, his eyes are shut. Yeah. And he just kind of pops awake as if he awakes from a nap and says, I've come <laughs> to my senses. And it's like the smallest little genius yeah. thing I've ever seen. It is so satisfying in the most simple way. You know what I mean? Like, oh, dude, pretend you're sleeping and then like wake up. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, like, I can just picture it being a pleasant thought process. Whoever pitched it, maybe it just came to his head while standing there. I don't know. It's just... I don't know. It seems so tiny, but it might be my favorite thing we've ever talked about on a music video. There's not much left to talk about because it's just him opening his eyes. But I think there's <laughs> this tremendous like, oh, f they were on one. That whole, you know, throughout yeah. Anthem, all the songs, all the videos for this, they were just like in the zone. Like every aspect, every ounce of what was happening just made sense and was fun and good, it seems like. No, I mean, I definitely do think it adds to the pretty like mellow energy of this song especially coming off like a lot of the other shit on this record it is very very fast so to like kind of start this song like half asleep whatever in this cartoon heavily animated world with literally no expense spared on the animation here it's nice man it's the song just it really like eases you in i've always loved the snare tone on it you've got a little bit of horns like i said it's like really down tempo compared to the rest just just nice man it's just it's a nice song yeah um and mixed into this nice song is animation that reflects the lyrical content i guess um that is not you know unlike other lyrical content in the less than jake extended universe but um rogers weaving through this cartoon cityscape and there's cartoon liquor stores and um <laughs> but it's kind of mixed with him doing these cartoon scenes but being in real life spots with his cartoon hands which i guess is the part of him that's his own worst enemy, I guess. But, um, you know, he finds himself in a bar, then he finds himself in a hospital bed where, like, the bandages on his head kind of becomes a snake, and it's just, like, really cool animation yeah. throughout. But the band, we find, is with him in the hospital playing, essentially, and he's out of the bandages and um, himself as the band member, not just, like, wandering through this, like, crazy world. It's pretty gnarly, man. Like, I really feel like they spared, like, no expense on this animation. Animation is extremely expensive. And if you watch a lot of, like, so Pokemon, for example, they do this, like, kind of cheat thing where, like, only one thing is moving at a time. So there's no, like, background moving or anything. But if you, yeah. the and more you, can you just watch. just tell, but it's still, yeah. Yeah. And the more you watch this video, the more you see there is movement 
just absolutely everywhere you look. There's like cartoon skeletons moving on the wall. The drivers, the speakers are moving in and out to the music. Clouds are moving. Beer bottles are dancing. I just, I have to feel like there must have been like thousands of of human hours put into making this video. And I can't imagine what poor PC, like GPU or CPU, had to render this fucking shit in the year 2003. I feel like it probably <laughs> took a week and a half and like $5,000 of electricity. <laughs> yeah, because even when he's like, I drank my frustrations down the drain out of the way, it's not just rain falling down. Like some of the rain droplets are bottles of alcohol, but yeah. there's like variants. And so like- even the tiniest, what you wouldn't expect there to be detail put into was, yes. and it's just like, oh shit, this is nice. It's just a nice little chunk of art. Like we've seen oh, yeah. some pretty bare bones f-ing music videos talked about <laughs> on the show, which we love dearly as well. But right, this is right. an, it's a nice thing. I feel weird even talking about it. Cause it's like, everyone should just watch it as like a homework assignment for the week. Like, I don't know if that's what you guys do when we do music video episodes or not, but um, this is one that's just like, it's a pleasure to absorb. And you know, I have a lot of like sympathy for the, for the band doing this video because they had to do the entire thing, presumably in front of a green screen. Uh, I think it's maybe <laughs> yeah. before they went to blue screens. You have to have a lot of faith in your director when you're just in like an empty room with absolutely no idea what's going on. Like I remember watching these behind the scenes <laughs> videos of Mad Max where like 99% of the entire video was in front of a blue screen. I don't know how they got into character to do that shit. I mean, this isn't Mad Max yeah. or anything, but... It's crazy to me where they're just like in a green room and that's it. How do you do anything? Everyone (laughs) jokes about how like Michael Jordan won however many championships. That's great. But he also managed to keep his sanity despite being locked in a green studio with a bunch of (laughs) dudes in head to toe green (laughs) pretending to be fake space alien monsters while filming Space Jam. And when you see the live footage of him just getting like accosted and assaulted during the basketball playing scenes of that movie you're just kind of oh like my god this might be this deserved an oscar honestly this is insane i remember watching transformers 3 being filmed because they did three days in downtown dc which of course there was like seven seconds of it in the movie but watching shia labeouf act as the director is yelling out what's happening because clearly there's no fucking robots like destroying the Lincoln Memorial. But it was just really interesting where like they had entire segments where they had like a single like tennis ball looking thing, like a target in front of, it wasn't the Lincoln Memorial, I forget what it was. And then this camera on a huge crane was just like moving all around the place and there was literally nothing happening. And then when I watched the movie, it was all just like CGI But, like, it would be so hard to be able to tell all that stuff ahead of time. I'm not a planner. I've never storyboarded shit. But I'm just thinking about what the band must be doing. Like, okay, like, pretend to walk because there's going to be these things on you. And they're just, like, acting, not knowing what's actually happening. To me, that's amazing. Yeah. You know what else is amazing? This song? (laughs) Krista Makes looks so much like Alan Covert in this music video. It drives me nuts. The guy, uh, you might know him from the movie Grandma's Boy. Uh, he's in a lot of Adam Sandler movies. Um, in this v- music video specifically, Chris has kind of this like bleach blonde hair coming out of his head like he just got electrocuted <gasps> oh, a little bit. Oh, that guy. <laughs> if, you've ever, if you've ever seen the Mr. Deeds remake, there's um, <laughs> Alan Covert plays this, um, I guess, uh, Inside Edition style, uh, I guess, uh, yeah. tabloid reporter. And he, <laughs> there's a scene where Adam Sandler is destroying his tennis opponent by like hitting the tennis ball into his throat and stuff. And anyway, <laughs> the guy is on, in disguise there and he, you know, he wants information on this guy and the guy ends up, he's soaping his ass and stuff. And I just picture <laughs> Krista makes his crazy hair. He, I don't know. They're not exactly doppelgangers when they, you put them in there, like not in this specific <laughs> scenario, but there's something about Demakes going like full send on the harmonies on the few shots he's in of this, mu- in this music video that is, I find admirable. I had no idea that was a remake. Mr. Deeds Goes to Town is a 1936 American comedy drama romance film. What? I'm sure it's considerably different. I've never seen the original, but I, I, I think, yeah, the character Mr. Deeds is not, was not. Save it for the post show, Tom. <laughs> That's nuts. D- dude, I am just in this Wikipedia page now. <laughs> anyways. Chris Mitch was actually anyways. in the original, and that, so it's kind of like that. that character looks really alike in both movies. Um, anyway, Alrighty. the cartoon hands in this music video, they're rolling dice, all the vices, right? Playing cards, oh, yeah, yeah, rolling yeah. dice. Roger Cigarettes, is walking through this cartoon city. Yeah. 
Yeah, and after the kitchen floor line, um, he's he's in the strip club, but it's a real strip club, sim- similar to the bar scene earlier. And the cartoon hands undo the woman's top, so like, pretty not heavy handed, I wouldn't say, but like, it becomes clear at this point that the cartoon hands are maybe not what he wants to be doing, but what he ends up doing. You know, the own worst enemy aspect to his psyche and things like that. So, um, right, because the entire video, Roger is just like. <laughs> And again, I kind of feel bad for him because, like, this is his, like, one chance to be a star and, like, really give it his all. And he has to play this, like, anemic, disengaged character the whole time because, like, the animation is the star of the video. This girl's, like, giving him a lap dance and he's just, like, not even looking at her, totally disengaged. The cartoon hands undo her top. Yeah, but I think it's possible. There's It's possible, just to play devil's advocate, that it was very, like, artistically... um Grat- like satisfying to him because it, I can only assume it like visually represents exactly the spirit of the song. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm just someone who's kind of what I feel like I'm just floating through life, but then I wake up on my best friend's kitchen floor and I'm like, apparently I'm making awful mistakes. You know what I mean? Like there's kind of this, like, how did I get here feel to just existing that, um, I don't know. I, I've always loved how this song kind of captures and in the video, I think, I think the hands thing really does. But to your point, like he definitely didn't have a long leash in front of the, the blue screen, or, right, blue screen right. or whatever. Right. I mean, but on the other hand, it's kind of like this music video freaking rocks. So no, I mean it's it is exactly what it should be. I could just imagine being like, oh man, I could be the front man, but like do nothing. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Right. Well, when you see him live, he has a different energy. But this song, admittedly, the band admits this is almost. It's so different. It's almost not even a less than Jake song, even though it, <laughs> you know obviously right. it is at this point. But um. You know, it is, it is like you, like you said earlier, you know, it's just got a different pace to it, different yeah, yeah. to it all together. Um, let's see. I think we're getting close here. Uh, yeah, we're at the bridge. Ooh, yeah. Demakes gets to come in from the top ropes. Um, he's at an 11 <laughs> out of 10, this whole video, which I admire. Yes, and in the background, Roger has t- become this like Godzilla King Kong mixed with Gulliver's yeah. Travels character. And he's maybe pulling himself. I'm not sure who's on the ropes, but you know, he's getting tied down in the cityscape while Demakes is just on the bridge of the city, kind of just, just <laughs> bringing a thunder, just crazy with the, with the back of vocals all song. And, uh, I have to, I, you know, got to appreciate the full sendness of it all. Oh yeah. I mean, his voice coming in for the bridge, like after like the clarity and like the sing songiness of Roger's voice, Chris coming in with like all the grit and the gravel that he offers is so nice. And, you know, we talk about like dual or multi vocalists a lot in a band blink being probably the biggest one for us taking back Sunday for the six kids as like nine singers somehow <laughs> less than Jake should be on this short list of most notable multi singer bands. You know, I thought about this week that this week too. Embarrassingly, as a as a youth, I listened to this band for years and I was like, kind of this week did I even spend time watching live performances and the videos and I'm like I'd never thought of them as a dual vocalist band. But yeah. you're right. I, I should have this whole time. Like and again, I it's like a running bit on the show, like, oh, you guys didn't real, realize something until ten years had gone by, like ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but like I didn't even think about it. Like, and in real time as a kid, right. I wasn't sure if it was one guy or two. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah, when you're yeah. a kid, you don't think of like, or like when you're in fifth grade, for example, and someone hands you a burn CD or whatever, people who grew up in the 2000s, that is, you're just like, don't immediately go and learn the names and the instruments they play. You know what I mean? Also, right, Wikipedia right. wasn't even really a thing at the time. So you couldn't have even really access that information that easily. Unless in the MySpace era, you went to the Fall Out Boy Facebook page, which was like apparently immaculately upkept. <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess the point being like, I didn't really think about it like intentionally until honestly this week, like, okay, this is the layout and feel of Less Than Jake because I've never had the pleasure of seeing them, Tom, which is like kind of the crime of this whole episode because uh, I'm jealous that you have got to. And it, it seems amazing. like based on the show we do and everywhere I've been, like the chances of me not running into them at some point <laughs> were pretty low <laughs> and I just haven't. And, you know, I really want to. Yeah. Oh, man. They they were so good. That was 16 years ago that I saw them, Pat. Literally more than half a lifetime ago. We should we should change that, man. We gotta, uh, gotta see them. Gosh, I think we're um. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, I guess the video does eventually end. Rogers walking down the street, got a little cartoon crown over his head, and uh, the cartoon vices are are like little their own little characters at this point, just kind of bouncing. Down yeah, the road, dancing him. beer bottles and cigarettes, and like so. Are we to assume that the vices won? And he's now like no, I think, with them. 
I think he's at peace with the knowledge that they'll be following him wherever he goes. Ah, uh, he's okay. making some realizations. This poem he's writing is him channeling his becoming a little more self-aware about who he is and how, you know what I mean? But they'll always be following him, perhaps, was kind of my takeaway. Mm. Okay. But he has the same energy walking away, like, man, there's nothing yeah. to about it now type Yeah, thing, totally, you know? totally. And he's like pretty much where he started on the boardwalk. You've got like the same girl in the bikini who was walking by him at the very beginning is now still there. So it's kind of like this whole thing happened in the blink of an eye. But I don't want to paint it like this happy-go-lucky song either. The To make right. bridge, <laughs> let the meaning slip away like... I am rarely listening to this song when I'm in a good place. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like right. I would like of all the playlists I've put this song on, it rarely makes my like headed to the amusement park today, and I'm gonna have the hypest time. It's definitely um, okay. Relying <laughs> it, <laughs> right? But, Not everything can be chap lips, chapstick. You know. Anyway, but I mean, we've done those episodes where it's like oh, let's pick songs about like being in these moods, that moods, right, doing this, right. Doing that the science does not make many of the upbeat happy ones um and it's i guess maybe it's supposed to be the self-realization peaceful good feeling thing but really it's a kind of a devastating tune uh, right i mean because the lyrics i think it's fine by me that i'm my own worst enemy so it's just like complacent right yeah and again we talk a lot of it every week like the listener makes it what it is and speaking to vinnie's point yeah yeah like, yeah the song takes on a new life even after it exits the band we talk about ben gibbard and uh jim atkins of jimmy Eat world talking about the same you know there is a life after and it is whatever the fan takes it as type thing because and that could be any number of variations on on what you know it is so um anywho yeah i was a little worried about this episode but um <laughs> i don't know lawrence park was a place to grow up and maybe it was unique maybe it wasn't <laughs> but um that at least the march man thing i would have to assume is a little unusual and uh, i think maybe i'm sticking to that theory who knows but um I, I, that's all i have this week tom no, that's, I don't have much else either. I mean, I've got a song of the week, but other than that, I really enjoy this song. I really love this album, man. It it might be there with the Desert Island on me. We got to talk about it more. Summer of Ska 2022. Yeah. Let's do it. It's a Summer of Ska. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. What do you got for right, Song of the it. Week? Oh, wait, no. Songs of the Week. Give me, I sent you this in a text the other day. Uh, the band Bearings released a song called Shaking Your Mind recently. And I am really, really into it. I cannot put my finger on who the vocalist voice reminds me of. I don't know if it's like, God, it's not Seaway. There's someone in the genre who he really reminds me of. But Bearings, I never really listened to them much. But the song Shaking Your Mind is really, really good. Nice. I have a few that I've could choose from but i'll stick because i said nuclepook last week uh gasoline but on that same release they do a cover of here's your lever letter by blink and that'll be my song of the week this whoa week. Um, yeah it's interesting i think it's worth your time um i i've also been listening to mom jeans and stuff but and there's like some new kohi that i'm listening to but i don't know if i want to pick those as songs of the week quite yet but um the new mom jeans record is tasty should we talk about a bunch of other stuff we're listening to in the post show because i got like a list of like not Japanese yeah. music that I really want to like get to. <laughs> Let's do it. If you uh, listen to this episode, we're grateful. Welcome to the Summer of Ska. <laughs> okay. It's the last time I'm going to do that. Unless we actually do the Summer of Ska, then that will definitely not be the last time I do that. Either way. Oh, gosh. Well. All right. Bye, Tom. <laughs> Bye. All right, everyone, I hope you had fun. Please hit us up on Twitter at underscore Reminiscent FM. Most of you know that's where the real action is. Again, if you'd like to check out the Patreon, you can head to patreon.com slash Reminiscent and see the three tiers that we offer there. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll catch you next week. I think it's St. Patrick's Day, so get your dumb glasses and your party hats on. We're going to celebrate.